All the meeting in order. All right. Tom Guster. Here. Scott Holwick. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Dan Wolper. Here. Ken Mason. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Evan Bowden. Here. Chris Huffer. Here. Um, Heather McIntyre is here. Joe Mahalski. Here. Holly Valenta. Here. And Councilmember Martin will not be able to join us today. Cherry Oak Club. Okay. Um, looking at previous month's minutes. Any questions or concerns about last month's minutes? The motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Very good. Kevin, you want to give us a lunch after the board? Sure. Um, the flow of the St. Frank's Day aligns with uh, 24 CFS. The 125 year historic average um, was 23 CFS for the state. Uh, the call on the St. Frank Creek is Pleasant Valley Reservoir, which has a priority date of uh, June 1st of 1871. Our call on the North Platte, on the South Platte River is North Sterling um, Canal with a priority date of 12-7-2004. Um, Ralph Pikes Reservoir at Button Rock is no longer sprung and is at an elevation of 6399.6, which is about four tenths from full, and which is down about 100 acres. Uh, Union Reservoir is at a gauge height of 24.3 or 10,180 acre feet, and that's down approximately 2,500 acre feet from full. Um, and at the end of October, our basin reservoirs were at 75 percent. So, bring them up a little bit from last month. <clears throat> Any questions for Kevin? Well, we've invited to be heard. Uh, yeah, what do you, what do you uh, thoughts about that? Uh, well, let me jump into Union Reservoir. Before I do that, I would like to uh, introduce Joe Mahalski, who's in our engineering group. Holly Valenta is uh, as well. Um, and Holly's doing a lot of our raw water system engineering, so uh, they're going to give kind of the engineering update for you today. But I just wanted to introduce them. And, that you know who's here today. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, we were, Water Resources was asked to do a, a short presentation on Union Reservoir and kind of update the board and, uh, and oops. So we wanted to kind of give an update on the history. I'll start with the history of Union Reservoir. Uh, so Union Reservoir started out as a, a natural lake. It actually sits in a little bit of a bowl. Um, some, a lot of geologists feel, feel it was kind of a terminal end of a the glacier that pushed up the land to the east side of it. But uh, we do know it was, for sure, it was uh, essentially a buffalo wall for thousands of years. Any buffalo that would come through here would, you know, they'd go out into it, drink both water and, and to get mud to, to get bugs. So they ended up kind of stirring it up and, and, and creating it, deepening it a little bit. but. Um, it was originally known as Calkins Lake. Um, uh, ben Calkins was the city's first city engineer. So when, in 1872, when they founded, um, Mr. Calkins actually built a house on the east side, northeast corner of the lake. The house still exists. Um, a gentleman by the name of Larry French is living in that house right now. That was the original house of, of Mr. Calkins. Mr. Calkins, not only was an engineer for the 
city engineer, but he also did a, a, a number of the area ditch and reservoir company work at the same time because he didn't have enough work to fully employ him at Longmont. Uh, and and uh, we've always thought really Calkins Lake um, that, that might have been named in honor of him or may, may have been named to, to teasing because it was not a <laughs> it was not a pleasant thing. It, you know, it just it was an old buffalo wallow and any water that got into it was just drainage water, so there wasn't any fresh water in it at all. It actually though was used to irrigate a lot of the land around it. Now Calkins Lake is an area that, uh, that was on the kind of center north side of what is Union Reservoir. Union Reservoir is much larger than Calkins Lake used to be. So um, that's important because to understand the reservoir versus original lake. Uh, but interesting enough, they were actually pumping water out of Calkins Lake, A, to irrigate the adjacent farmland, but also irrigate some farmland that was on the south side of today's Union Reservoir and east of what we now call the Union Life Bridge property, about a half section there, uh, such that when in 1902, the Union Ditch Company, and the Union Ditch Company diverts out of the South Platte River down by LaSalle, just kind of a little bit west of LaSalle. They divert out of the South Platte River and irrigate a lot of the land east of US 85, kind of east, really east of LaSalle, south of Greeley. Um, Union Reservoir Ditch was built by members of the Union Colony, which we today call Greeley. Um, but it was, it was a project to get additional farmland for, for the who came out to, to live in the Greeley area. Um, but its decree was, again, a little bit more junior on the, on the Platte River, and so they had trouble with uh, late season water. So they came up to the, to the Longmont area and purchased property around Caucus Lake and, and adjacent farmland around it to form the Union Reservoir Company. So, Originally, all of the water went down to the South Platte for uh, uh, water, uh, supplemental water. It was really used to supplement their ditch. And it was used almost exclusively in August and September. They had enough water in the Platte to, for early summer, but to finish out their growing season, they would deliver water out in August and September. Um, in the 1950s, um, more and more farmers on the Platte started drilling groundwater wells in the 50s and 60s. And so the use of the Union Reservoir water directly into the ditch um, lowered, uh, got, got smaller, and, and eventually the water was sold off to a couple other ditch companies for the downstream, but also um, in the 60s and 70s, it was leased to gas, which was the groundwater appropriated in South Platte. They used it to augment um, out of priority depletions of groundwater wells on the Platte River. Um, then, uh, in the 1980s, uh, a water broker out of Boulder assembled a um, controlling interest in the reservoir, um, and Longmont then acquired uh, that controlling interest, that 52% interest, in 1986. Um, so the acquisition by Longmont, really, um, if you, you go back in our records, um, we actually have, have been looking at acquiring interest in Union Reservoir since really the early 1960s. And it was actually one of the alternatives that was looked at um, when we were studying options for storage, including for Button Rock. Um, Button Rock being above our treatment plant, the higher quality water, eventually was chosen as the water storage vessel that Longmont would pursue. But even back then, Longmont had expressed an interest in acquiring Union Reservoir. Um, so then in 1986, when the, the water broker had acquired the controlling interest, it was really obvious to us. Um, he came to Longmont and said, hey, you know, I've, I've acquired this um, interest, this controlling interest, company is Longmont wanted. He says, yes, no, absolutely. Um, 
we acquired it, initially acquired it by using fund balances, but we had to pay those fund balances back. And then in 1987, um, we had a special election in March in 1987, uh, asked the voters if they would pass a bond to pay for um, the uh, funds that we expended to acquire the reservoir. So in 1987, we actually did that. Um, however, in December, we, we closed on Union Reservoir in December 1987. And when, when we did that, we filed for a uh, conditional decree to enlarge the reservoir. So that was one of the first things we wanted to do was not only did we want the existing reservoir, but the ability to enlarge it in the future for additional storage. And when we get into kind of how and why we use Union Reservoir, it will be pretty obvious why we wanted to enlarge it. Um, and then we also applied for a conditional decree uh, to operate some exchanges, are you exchanges from Union Reservoir up to uh, ditches and turnouts above above Longmont, and, uh, and again I'll cover that here uh, quickly. And then after we filed those in 1986, and then early in 1987 we filed for a formal change decree for the underlying water right. So there's there's really three things here we're going to cover. In, Minute. That is the enlargement as a separate filing, the exchange decrees as a separate filing, and the change decrees as a separate filing. So, um, a lot going on with uh, Union Reservoir. So, first, we want to talk about the, uh, before we get to the enlargement, talk about the uh, existing reservoir. Um, first is the 1986 exchange decree. Um, and that exchange decree, basically the concept behind that is we can deliver water out of Union Reservoir and then that would meet delivery obligations that, that would be coming down, down the stream, down the river, rather than having those come from above us, we would, we would um, deliver them to uh, the river and then we would take the life out of the water upstream. Probably even more importantly, we had um, we had approached, we hadn't actually entered into agreements, and we really still haven't yet, but we had a plan to um, pump some of the water up to both the upper supply ditch um, and the highland ditch. The highland ditch being the biggest ditch in the St. Range Creek Valley. Um, we would exchange water, we would deliver water to them, we would take a like amount of water at Lyons, where their, their diversion points are, and, uh, and take those into our treatment plants and our other storage reservoirs. That was one of the biggest exchanges, uh, and, and you really needed to do that. Originally, we were going to put in a pipeline straight north of the Union Reservoir, up to those two ditches, but after looking it over for a decade or so, we realized um, there was other opportunities uh, to do exchanges, so we, we then developed, further refined that into what we call the Union Reservoir Pumpback Pipeline Project. And we'll, again, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. But that was um, how we would do those exchange things. And then um, the 19, 1987, we applied for a change decree. And that was, uh, that was a pretty good effort to get that, <laughs> that particular change decree in because it's really, Involved uh, changing the underlying decree for Union Reservoir uh, and using it in a lot of different ways. Um, so the first thing, so so once we got the change decree, then we can use that water for for municipal purposes and all the changed uh, uh, uses that we apply for. Uh, for us, the first one is and probably our foremost area way we use Union Reservoir is by delivering water out of Union Reservoir to the St. Rain Creek. Um, when we, all of our entire other water portfolio, our, our, our historical and non-historical water rights that we get, we have to go into water court and change those. And by doing that, then we end up with a, a return flow obligation that we owe to the stream. Um, 
Most of our water is water that was in the Longmont area. Um, Longmont Supply Ditch, Oligarchy Ditch, you know, um, a lot of the dishes around Longmont that their return flow returned basically between Golden Ponds and the wastewater treatment plant in Longmont. So this, this area here. Some of them a little bit even further east than that, but both basically that return to the river was here in the Longmont area. And so we're able to deliver directly out of Union Reservoir that replicates those historic return flows, uh, not only in time, but in place, right, right at the wastewater plant or right below the wastewater plant. That prevents us from having to use some of our water. So there are times when we don't have quite enough water in either Union or our wastewater plant. We actually have to deliver water out of Button Rock all the way down and deliver it down here. A, that's very difficult to do, <laughs> um, being able to get the water downstream past every one of the head gates, um, past every stream gauge, stream, stream gauge, and show them that that water is in there. So um, not only is it difficult to get the water to all the way down the basin, but it's also um, water that you know is upstream that we can use. So we really don't like doing that, being able to deliver it out of Union Reservoir. So that's really critical to our overall operation in the city. Uh, the second thing we do is we deliver it um, down St. Grant Creek and exchange it with downstream water users. I think the board is probably pretty familiar with the uh, exchange agreement we have with the public service company in Colorado. That's the biggest, most useful one we have. Um, we can deliver up to uh, 3,500 acre feet uh, Exchange up to 3,500. That's basically public service company in Colorado has CBT water that they primarily use at the St. Green Power Plant, but they also use at you know just east of here, um, and it's located right at the confluence of the St. Green Creek and the South Platte River. And public service company for years, uh, well, uh, originally they used some of it directly, but basically what the public service company was doing. They, they didn't want to pull direct flow of water off either the same way they did flat. So they would pump alluvial groundwater wells along the flat river in the same way, right around the plant, and, and higher quality water, or at least less suspended solids. Higher quality water that they could put in their plant and use for generation of power, but then they had to augment that out of priority depletions with CBD water. Well, that worked great for years, but then Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District does not allow uh, the use of CBT water for augmentation water. So Fiesta was sitting down there with a lot of CBT water, but they couldn't use it. <laughs> and we're sitting up here with a lot of water that, that by going through the change case, is fully consumable, easily delivered whole to the public service with our augmentation plan. So we entered into a 75 year agreement to exchange our water, CBT, and we, we exchange a lot to them. We also exchange water from the wastewater treatment plant. That's the first thing we do. Whatever fully consumable life we have from out of the wastewater plant, we <coughs> use that water first, and then we supplement it with even reservoir water. But because of that large exchange, there's not enough. Um, that exchange is, is, so it's great for both of us, and then we get CBT water that's ready to go in our water treatment plant. So their use of water is primarily for the, the plant? Primarily for the plant, cooling water. Yeah, yeah. for that right. single plant. That one single plant. Now they also use it at uh, the Pawnee plant at Brush. And so one of the reasons that's good for us and them um, is that they usually how they get, how they use the brush, they deliver down the South Platte or the South <coughs> Creek and the South Platte to, um, to Jackson Reservoir. They have an agreement. So with Jackson Reservoir, it's primarily irrigation. So they take all their water out in July and August, early September, and they got a big hole. Then they're a little bit more junior on the river. So a lot of times they don't get a fill till mid to late winter. So they got about a six month period where they have an empty reservoir out there. And, and there's space. So what public, what public service company Colorado does is we give them a, a, a slug of water. Um, 
sometimes 70 CFS <laughs> out of Union Reservoir. Um, the ad goes down and they pull it into Jackson Reservoir, and we usually do that September ish, October ish. And, uh, in fact, it's already been done this year. Um, and then they store it in Jackson, and then they deliver it out of Jackson Reservoir all winter long. That gives them the winter water they need to augment uh, their, again, they, they call groundwater wells on the south plant down by brush. It augments the winter depletions, and then in summer they have um, change direct flow irrigation water rights, but those irrigation water rights only yield, uh, you know, in the summer. So this gives them water. So, so it's really both plants, but it's primarily uh, the same thing. CDT is not used for augmentation because it's not reusable water. Um, uh, so the, it, it, it's a policy of the uh, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. They don't allow it to be used. Um, so when the CBT system was first um, developed, the, the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District had to go out and, and get basically vote in the district in whether or not there would be a district, whether or not there would be a CBT project. <coughs> and they had, the district goes clear out to Julesburg to the Nebraska state line. So it was a little more difficult to convince somebody in Julesburg, <laughs> oh, well, I, why should I pay for this, you know? Um, and what kind of the, the, the promise was that, well, not only um, uh, does the use of the CBT occur up here, but the return flow will accrue to the river and benefit everybody. And so when the CBT system was um, developed, voted on, and we have, everybody has to have a lot of contracts. So when we signed a lot of contracts for the CBT system, we basically get the first use of that CBT water. We can use as much as we want. Um, you know, there's, there's no requirement, but once we've used it once, we have to return that to the stream. Now, um, for the, the agricultural use of it, you know, it's gonna seep into the ground, it's gonna run out the end of your field, you can't recover that, I mean, it, it does go back to the stream. But for municipal uses, it goes through, well, some of it goes in on the irrigate lawns, and then you have lawn irrigation return flow. We, if it's, uh, if it's our water rights, if it's a fully consumable water right, we can claim uh, fully, we can claim, we can claim the lawn irrigation return flows. For CBT, we can. It, it just returns the river. And for that portion that goes through our water treatment plant, um, if we have to color, basically color our water as it goes into the water treatment plant, runs through the system, and then when it hits the wastewater treatment plant, that portion of the CBT water, it returns to the stream and we, we can't use it, we can't reuse it, we can't claim something that's fully consumable a good example is the windy gap water it's fully consumable we then own that return flow and can get credit in the stream for that return flow so yeah that's why um the district then they said you, the district made a policy that you can't use cbt water for augmentation because augmentation is 100 percent consumed consumed when, when they made that policy for about four or five years, it kind of they had a ramp down onto it, and they actually allowed it to be used if you doubled your water. Uh, so if you needed an acre foot of augmentation water, you had to deliver two acre foot of CBT water. Um, but again, that was a little less than efficient for the CBT system, and uh, the augment, and, and that would have also kind of all the CBT water, <laughs> and the district didn't want to see that happen either. So yeah. That's why you can't you can't reuse the ED water. You can't reuse the water. So one more question. Sorry. So you mentioned uh, Jackson. That's uh, the state park down there, right? It is. Yeah. So so I mean, having a, a full reservoir is probably good for a few reasons. I mean, uh, you know, to, uh, just as an aesthetic thing, but also wildlife purposes. Et yeah, if you're a duck hunter, you love it. <laughs> yeah. it, it does, you know, puts water in the in the reservoir. So there, so there's another benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because of, of it, more than anything else, it helps the, the fishery there, because 
you know, when the, water, the, the lake gets too low in winter, um, I don't, you know, it's not, it's not a real deep lake to begin with. They have had you know, problems with the fish. So yeah, that, that does sound pretty cloudy. Um, reservoir down there. So anyway, that's kind of our second biggest use of Union Reservoir to deliver it to downstream use. And we have a few, we've had some others, or some of the, some of the ditches downstream, um, I'll, an example would be the uh, Lower Latham Ditch, which is between LaSalle and Greeley. They own some, a bunch of CBD water, and they used to take that CBD water and actually took it down to um, Big Thompson, because it was e a little easier to get it down the Big Thompson River, um, and, and that hits the South Platte right off their head gate. But um, they used to exchange with us because the, the loss that they incurred running the water all the way down the Big Thompson, the half a percent per mile, all the way down the Big Thompson to the Headgate, was much higher than if we delivered out a Union Reservoir and got it, got it down to them easier. So they would take Union Reservoir water and then we would, we would um, get their CBT water. And again, uh, both the video for both of us. So there, so there are some smaller exchanges like that, but, but yes. Then finally, uh, or sec next, uh, just maintenance of adequate storage reserves. The nice thing about Union Reservoir, again, it's pretty big. Um, it, it allows us to carry over water from one year to the next. Um, and that's especially important during drier years when um, almost always, we're almost always able to get Union Reservoir in priority and at least not, not till we fold reason we feel but it, um, some of our other storage, you know, storage rights will come in in real dry years. So we can then carry over, we use about, I'm going to say probably three to four thousand, probably four or four, sometimes five thousand acre feet out of, and Union's twelve thousand eight hundred at the storage, we, we, it's actually thirteen thousand two hundred capacity for reservoir, it's around thirteen thousand acre feet. So we, that gives us plenty of water. That gives us water that we can use during during drought periods. And that's very important. Um, so and then the, 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 that, that's just for that's for non-municipal uses for all the things that we kind of just discussed because there, there's currently no way to get water from the union back into our municipal system. Not directly. That's what the exchanges do. And, yeah, and, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and so, yeah, we, and we'll talk. Well, and that's kind of our future plan here. We get even more of that. But um, You yeah, said that but, one time there in a, and I think the future plan, of course, consists a little bit of this. And at one time, you said that there was a plan to put, <coughs> to, to have water be able to move back up to the Highland Ditch or something. And, and um, but that was never, that hadn't been built yet. Yeah. Just a small portion of it. All of it hasn't been built yet. Yeah. And when we get to the of that pipeline, I'll, I'll go through that. But yeah, right now it's just all all of our all of these other uses and the ways we use Union Reservoir um, is how how we would use that. And do we have yes. unlimited exchange exchanges, or I mean, there's a limit on that. I mean, it's well, it would be limited by the half of the water we have in the Union Reservoir. But in terms of the state. You know, state engineer's office. It, like we can do as much as we want, as long as we're returning as much. Like whatever we take out upstream, we put back in. You know? Yeah. Um, the concept. That's the correct concept. Um, it really a little bit of it depends on whether or not um, what agreements we can get with upstream users yeah. and how much their demand is. One of the things we're finding in our basin. Um, I don't want to go too far away from Union Reservoir. <laughs> One of the things we're finding in our basin is we've got a lot, we've got some, a little bit more water on the bottom end of it that um, is becoming harder to exchange up. Um, so one, one good example is the Lake Mackintosh. Used to be owned by the Highland Ditch Company and they used it as an exchange reservoir. They put the water in the Oligarchy Ditch took the water that would have gone into Oligarchy Ditch and into the Highland Ditch. But they also have um, uh, Foothills Reservoir, which is even larger, 
between foothills and Macintosh, they have more water to exchange. Well, and then of course the oligarchy dish. We kept building houses <laughs> up and down the oligarchy dish. <coughs> sort of less and less use of the oligarchy dish in ditch. And it got to a point where there wasn't enough use, there wasn't enough use of the, of the oligarchy ditch to exchange all that water. So the Highland ditch um, turned, you know, turned Lake McIntosh into a private company, allowed its shares to be held by the Highland ditch company owners, and then they sold that water. So at this point we had a lot of Lake McIntosh because they just they couldn't exchange it. And um, it, it, yeah, it's even that's a whole secondary exchange. So yeah, it's really not so much the state, you know, uh, saying how much you can exchange, it's what, what's out there that uh, has the availability of exchange. You really gotta get into the higher position because we don't have that capacity yet. So eventually, yeah. Um, one other, uh, important area, long range planning for Union Reservoir is to maximize utilize, utilization of our change to ditch water rights. Um, we basically split the St. Rain Creek into what we call upper ditches and lower ditches. All the ditches above North 75th, above hygiene, um, are what we call the upper ditches, and all the ditches below hygiene we call the lower ditches. The reason for that is that during the spring runoff, there's enough water and all the ditches get water coming out off the snow melt. But later in the season, and every ditch is different, but just to kind of draw a line, around the 4th of July, there's not enough water coming out of the mountains to meet all of the ditches calls. And so the ditches on the lower end of the ditch are, are benefiting from return flow from the ditches on the upstream, upper end of the St. Grand Creek. And so they basically start functioning as a return flow ditch. So when we change, when we get those water rights, so keep it, you might remember, most of the ditches in the Longman area up to hygiene are the more senior ditches. More, because we basically built just south of here, or just north of here, at Burnham. We built the ditches, the senior ditches are right here in Longmont, and they kept building ditches as they went west towards hygiene. And the more junior ditches are upstream, but they're taking the virgin water, what we call virgin flow of water. Um, and so in summer, if we own, for those ditches we own above hygiene, we're able to change those in water court and use those all summer long. But the ditches that are downstream, we can't use them. We, we can use them when they're in virgin flow until about 4th of July. Then we have to use them down here. And of course, again, we use them for um, return flow obligations. That's one of the ways we use them. We deliver them to some of the lower ditches um, and we use them for irrigation of parks and greenways. That's another way we can use them. Um, but one of the things we want to, we want to we can also do is because we've got new <coughs> reservoir sitting out there, if it's down, we can store those um, lower ditches in Union Reservoir. And we do do that some. Um, for one reason is we're storing fully consumable water. That change to lower ditches is fully consumable and um, it, it maximizes our, our utilization of the reservoir. Um, when we use Union water, half of it is a return flow obligation and half is fully consumable. And we're only at 50% of the actual stored water in Union if it's a Union degree, whereas if it's a lower ditch degree, we get 100% of the water we can store in there. So again, that increases our fully consumable portion out of the Union Reservoir, and we do have minimum obligations that we have to deliver anyway, but <clears throat> utilizing that for those lower ditches um, is currently usable, and in the future, as our demands increase as we need more water, that um, utilizing that for those lower ditches is very, very valuable to us in the future, uh, long term. Uh, then the next one uh, is, and this is in our, in our change cases, is direct use um, or the first use of the upstream storage of the Union Reservoir storage. Degree. This is one that actually when we talk, talk about it, it's like duh, but people don't always see it. 
um, current or for a hundred years, um, Union Reservoir filled off all of Erky Ditch. All of Erky Ditch diverts just south and a tiny bit west of McCall Lake. So it's diverting upper ditch water, uh, good clean water. It's diverting that water down, it, it diverts into Oligarchy Ditch, goes through town, that fills Union Reservoir. <coughs> it, you know, good way, it, you know, has always been a great way to fill Union Reservoir. Another way you can think of that is uh, another way to fill it, and, and you kind of think of it as the same as running it down the irrigation ditch, is that we can divert it at our water treatment plant, run it in pipes, run, the, run those pipes through town, and then we get to use it in, the, in our homes and businesses. And we use that water as a first use, then we treat it at the wastewater treatment plant, and then by exchange down here at Dickens Park, um, we take the, that, we actually drop it into the same range and take water right above flow, we put it in the creek, a like amount of water. But that water that would, Otherwise, have filled Union Reservoir in the ditch. Now, basically, fills Union Reservoir by going through the pipes, getting, being able to be used by the citizens of Longmont, and then it's pumped up into all of our ditch and delivered into Union Reservoir. So, same thing happens in Union Reservoir. It gets it gets filled, um, but Longmont uses it first, and that's a dual use of that same water. So that's really important. Uh, <coughs> aspect of the whole union reservoir um, to create. Um, and then finally, um, there's an in-basin exchange opportunities and increased delivery capacity. You know, all the exchange opportunities that are now and in the future will be available with Union Reservoir are there. Uh, one of the nice things is Union Reservoir has an outlet capacity of 95 CFX. Other than button rock, most everything we have is you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 CFS capacity. So um, in the case of uh, public service company, Colorado, we wouldn't be able to do some of the changes we do with them when they call and say, hey, I need 70 CFS. <laughs> um, but Union Reservoir, because of its delivery capacity, we're able to do that. Um, most all of, all of everything we do and deliver out of Union Reservoir we deliver a little bit of water in July and August for um, return flow obligations, and a little bit of water, well, and some water is the, the half of the storage and return flows, but we deliver that. But, but basically, we deliver most of our water out of Union Reservoir in the winter. Um, and later on, we'll talk about recreation out there, and that, you know, that, that benefits the recreation. Really kind of a shift of, you know, we talked about earlier when it was the farmers using it, the, the Union Ditch, originally all the water came out in July and August, and by the end of August it wasn't the greatest place to <laughs> be out there fishing because there, there wasn't much water in there. So, so that's really how we use um, Union Reservoir. I, I, I probably over the years have been asked more often than any other facility I have, we have, why do you got a reservoir east of Longma? You can't, you can't use it, you know, you can't get the water anywhere. You know, how, why do you have Union Reservoir? And I say, Union Reservoir is one of our workhorses. <laughs> you know, it really, um, when you understand how all this stuff works, it, it, it really comes into, into fruition. That's why we want to do that. Was that outlet capacity always present, like as soon as the dam was built, or did there be some subsequent work get done to expand that? Did that that's a significant that, that is significant. No, that's, we, we have the original outlet gates. Reservoir, um, 20 year. Yeah, so don't ask me about that. <laughs> we, uh, so we, the company's gonna have to spend a little bit of money one of these days, but it's amazing. Yeah, no, we've got the original outline from day one from 1902. So, um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about the expansion uh, of Union Reservoir. So, as in 1986, we uh, acquired the original interest of the company. We filed for an enlargement decree. Um, that's case number. The current decree capacity of the reservoir is 13,219 acre feet. The enlargement capacity at its largest, largest capacity, as the, um, the increased capacity is 19,800 acre feet, or total um, reservoir potential capacity of 
32,000 acre feet. Now that's huge. <laughs> that's uh, when you think about it. That's um, almost, almost two lot blocks, 32,000. So that's really useful. Um, and and really, it would, it would give us a, make all of these operational. We could do all of these operations out of that. Um, Longmont uh, uh, in, in 2007, we did an enlargement feasibility study, kind of looked at it. And we, we looked at really um, a number of different enlargement opportunities, probably um, around 13 foot would be the, the lowest reasonable uh, raise just because it costs you so much money to get out and do something, you know, to build a reservoir. So if you did much less than a 13 foot raise, the unit cost would be pretty high. Obviously, as you go up in, in capacity, the unit cost goes down. Um, the total cost does go up, but the unit cost continues down. Um, but Longmont has always looked a little bit, and this, this will be interesting, this is well down into the future, but. Well, it's always looked at the possibility of having a partner um, in enlarging Union Reservoir. We actually had talked with a public service company in Colorado for uh, probably a couple of decades. <laughs> um, they were interested in uh, being a partner with the Walmart and public service company in Colorado. Uh, then they converted the St. Green plant from a nuclear plant to a gas fired plant. And with other plant options, you know, they're not really looking for more capacity. Um, they, they feel that really their, their water supply, in addition to a number of ditches and reservoirs and, and other units, but big, big water supplies of CBT. They own 10,000 units of CBT, which is incredible holding. It's almost as big as long the incredible holding of, of CBT water. Um, well, well yeah, the, the enlargement capacity, that's a proposal, basically. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's the... If you were going to enlargement, enlarge it, that's kind of the capacity you would be looking at to enlarge it. That extent? Um, probably not for Longmont's purposes, but for the... With a partner, yes. It'd be the maximum we can raise. We can go anywhere from about 5,000 acre feet up to 32,000 acre feet. So, but you want to you want to file. We wanted to file in 1986 for the largest expansion possibility to tie up those water rights. So our water rights are 1986, which you know, don't sound very. <laughs> they sound pretty junior, but quite honestly, they're in front of a incredible amount of uh, augmentation and place, you know, placement water type projects on the main stem and, and, and also, you know, during parts of the year. It, it's a better decree than it would have been. But as far as the enlargement, what, what's our thought about actually going ahead with an enlargement? Is this kind of on an as-needed thing? If, yeah, it'll it'll depend on on long launch growth and future water demands and everything that we've we've looked at on our future water supply. Um, we originally we actually were were ready to start looking at tying and, and constructing the project at Union Reservoir. We were actually starting to, to just starting to look at that when um, the Windy Gap Firming project uh, started initiating its exploration um, and we actually we got quite a quite a length of water board about this in the late 1990s um, we, we struggled with uh, well we, we like the idea that Union Reservoir is owned by us uh, totally you know in our our control um, but on the other hand the Woody Gap Firming Project is above our water treatment plant, so it can be delivered directly to our water treatment plant. So there's benefit there without relying on any kind of exchange or pump back or anything like that. 
So, um, and then really the Windy Gap Fermi project was a joint project of other water, you know, 12 other water users. So really it wasn't that, its schedule wasn't in our control I mean, as, a, as a joint project. It was everybody's, we had to look at everybody's schedule. So because, so basically we ended up flipping when you have Fermi, this is a project we're going to get done next, and that's that's going to take us 20, 30 years into the future. And so then that's when, we, after that, that's when the reservoir will be looked at. It's not something that we're going to continue. What's to our size of what we get out of with the one you have for me? We're worried that at, at volume wise, we're at 7,500 acre feet. Um, that gives us about or I wish I remember off the top of my head, right? 2,500, 2,700 okay. acre feet firm. But the actual size of our is 7,500. Would have loved to have more, but you know, everything costs money. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so that's that. So, we had the, what, what I just went through quickly, I mean, just to give a kind of perspective here, like, what's the footprint of a uh, Union that is 32,500 acre feet. So that's that's a 21 foot vertical raise, and um, it's more than I mean, so it, like the, I mean, I'm just thinking about the topography out there. I mean, does that take it uh, to a county line road or something, or is that like um, it on the we would have a dam on oh, the south side and the, side and the west side. So, the, so the, really, there's no more footprint there. On the east side, it, it would go up 19 foot, but the east side, pretty steep slope over there. So, you know, a couple hundred feet of additional capacity. On the north side, it's really it goes pretty far north. It goes a half a mile north. The north side of the Union is pretty shallow and very gently sloped, so it would be more. Now, um, depending on the raised height, we actually would have to have a pipe closed conduit from the reservoir going towards County Line Road because the, the grade of the, the, the height of the dam is higher than the ground west of the dam. So we'd have to have a pipe. Depending on whatever the raised height, you'd have to take a foot of the east. So we actually would go clear to County Line Road and maybe deep south a little bit to the greater raised heights. There's probably you know, more about five or six feet, uh, and then we'd have to start running pipe. We'd have to have a basement site and close pipe going to the west. So, yeah, that can help. So, in fact, the very highest race heights, we would not use the current location. We'd come down to County Road 26, pick up the Oliver Ditch on the railroad tracks, the western railroad tracks, and come down that way just to get the grid. Sounds interesting. So I think I talked about some of the uses of that. Again, it, it would provide us additional water use. Um, then the final, the third kind of leg of this whole thing is the Union Reservoir Pump Act Pipeline. And I'll jump up here to look at it a little bit. But the proposal would be to put in a pump station at Union Reservoir. Now this project, um, to be real honest, I would, it's most likely in the future when we look at this, you're going to do the pump back pipeline before you do the Union Reservoir enlargement because the pump back pipeline gives us additional water supply and it gives us um, immediate use of the water that we have at Union Reservoir. We're not relying upon other types of exchanges um, and so it can be utilized fairly quickly. Also, if you build it now, uh, you know, we build the pump station back away from the reservoir so that when the reservoir is enlarged, you know, all the facilities are going to uh, continue to work. But the idea is to come in here, put in a pump station on, on what is currently city property. Um, then the water would come up here, um, and the, there, there's four separate um, portions to this project. Um, it's envisioned that we wouldn't build all of them at once. I may not build all of them ever, we don't know. Um, the first leg of the pump station 
would come basically come from Union Reservoir up to, I'm going to call it the Ute Creek Golf Course, but it's really a rough and ready ditch <laughs> that we're trying to, trying to get to. Um, by doing that, we're able to hit, um, there, you know, three schools, there's the uh, city's Stephen Day Park, um, and then there's a the Ute Creek Golf Course. Right now, all of, all of this area under the rough and ready ditch, there's a lot of raw water irrigation, which is really good from a water conservation standpoint, but all the water comes out of the Pleasant Valley Reservoir. Pleasant Valley Reservoir is, there's a couple of real small reservoirs, but basically the Pleasant Valley Reservoir is the most senior ditch, and it has the senior call on the St. Rain Creek. So starting on November 1st, and usually sometimes running clear into January, but in the winter when when we're having to use storage water out of that raw storage water out of CBD, we're pulling water out of here. Longmont could use that water in its water treatment plant, and then by by exchange later on deliver water in the first phase of the pumpback pipeline to the rough and ready ditch. And then the rough, rather than delivering it out of Pleasant Valley Reservoir, you would deliver it out of Union Reservoir. Um, and in addition, you know, you got the Fox Hill Country Club. So you got two golf courses, numerous city parks, three or four schools, got a lot of use on the lower end of the rough and ready ditch. And we could u utilize Union Reservoir water um, to do that. There, here's my big plug on, on the whole pumpback pipeline. So one of the one of the advantages, and I probably should have mentioned this, of Union Reservoir, is that when we have ex, we normally don't have any excess um, flows out of the water treatment plant. Um, we currently utilize ninety five to sometimes one hundred percent of the fully consumable effluent out of our wastewater treatment plant. There's not many there's not many entities anywhere that can talk about reusing their their treated their treated wastewater effluent to that extent. I mean, I don't know of anybody. A lot of places try to build a, a reclamation plant and pipe it back into the treated water distribution system. I personally like our, <laughs> our option better where we use it, utilize it by exchange, but um, that's getting that wastewater effluent in the Union Reservoir. With, with the pump back pipeline, we even go one step beyond that. Not only can we continue to improve the efficiency of, of reusing those reusable supplies, but we do it by putting it directly on a city facility. And you know, from a water rights perspective, maybe that isn't much difference, but from you know a public policy standpoint, it's nice that we're we're using we're using the water and then we're treating it and then we're reusing it on a city facility. And so I think I, I think that's really great and that's something that, that we can do. So that's phase one as deliver water to this end. Then phase two is to um, come down uh, Highway 66 um, to uh, just west of Lake McIntosh. That's really the biggest vein and the biggest part of the pumpback pipeline because it does a couple things. One is we then would be able to drop water into the oligarchy ditch at that point. They go down the oligarchy ditch and we got all tons of city parks <laughs> on the oligarchy ditch that we can uh, do again direct reuse of our wastewater well, and other water in union reservoir um, we can put it in a mac lake macintosh lake we can um, deliver it out of there to our plants so that's and then also you can jump up here to the rough and ready ditch and that would then let you put water in pleasant valley reservoir um, or again take water out, out of that ditch and then also the highland ditch so right here uniquely right here at the lake mcintosh you've got access to the oligarchy ditch the <coughs> supply ditch the rough and ready ditch and the highland ditch those four ditches hold the bulk of the water in the same rate so that, i mean you really are benefiting you're really increasing your ability to exchange water at that point that's a you know extremely critical point so that's phase two of the project really opens up uh, what we can exchange uh, to that third leg of it would be to bring it on up here to um, birch lake all reservoir number one 
Um, and the advantage to that is, A, we have a current water treatment plant there. Probably won't ever turn that plant on again, but we don't know. We might put some filters in there, uh, who knows. But again, that decree, we could take into the water treatment plant because it's coming out of St. Green Creek um, uh, by Lyons above our, our turnouts, at our turnouts. We could take that, and then we could fill Birch Lake out of Union Reservoir. So take that like amount of water. That's over a thousand acre feet right there. Um, and then uh, we don't have current plans for it, but then there's a pump station at the um, island at the water treatment plant here, we can put in a new pump station and pump it up to our water treatment plant. So we can actually physically run it up to our treatment plant. We're not planning on that right now, but you know, having this facility and having this planning um, lets you do something. The, good, the neat thing about that would be you'd, you'd run the water up here, you'd treat it, you'd run it through your system, you'd pump it up to Union, you'd pump it back up to the plant, and you just start running around in circles until you fully consume that water. Um, summer, we only have about 35-ish um, percent of the water that would be reusable because, partially because of how much is used on lawn irrigation. <coughs> but in the winter, we have in the 90 to 95 percent return flow. So, you know, if you only use 5 percent of the water, you can run around that circle a lot of times. Not that, not that we're, we're not currently planning on that, but we certainly keep that as a backup opportunity. Um, who knows what, what's going to happen in our water in the future? <laughs> you know, and so this this whole pump back pipeline scheme provides us with future opportunities um, to use. Um, I honestly believe that when you start down here, you you can get as you go up, you get more and more exchange opportunities the further you build the pipeline. I think there's going to be plenty of exchange opportunities down lower um, that we'll be able to consume any water that we want to run up there. Well, with looking forward with Chimney Hollow coming on, how does that impact this need? Um, does it tend to diminish this? Well, it diminishes it for now, for the next 20, 30 years, um, and hopefully um, it, we, we, it will provide that water for long run. Possibly to build out of the city. Um, you know, we, we don't know. We do know that um, it's all fully consumable water out of Chimney Hollow. So having that fully consumable water allows you to do this scheme versus um, having CBD, which is great. I love CBD, but it's not fully consumable, so we can't use it in all these schemes, um, all these plants. Um, so uh, how much we'll need. How much of this we need to build in the future, we don't know, but we absolutely want to keep everything, all the plans on the drawing board, and, you know, and all of our water port applications, conditionals, uh, going because when, you know, if you lose them, then you lose them, and you lose that priority. And so um, this is this is again, we're looking towards the future, way down in the future. Always. Oh, I will tell you, um, this. This part of the pipeline is already in the ground. It's been in the ground for about 10 or 15 years. There was a development that was going in there that we had to get it in the ground before the development was built. And, and we're, we're currently using it. Um, we pump out of Spring Gulch number two, uh, which is the Gulf, goes through the Gulf Course and goes past Union Reservoir. We have water rights on Spring Gulch number two. So we pump those water rights into that pipeline and it delivers, currently delivers the Stephen Day Park and um, the Fall River, Fall River Elementary School. So these two green spots here are currently uh, being irrigated out of this pullback pipeline. And so uh, that's, you know, again, lowers the treated water demand um, by quite a bit. So that's that's the pullback pipeline. Um, Sure. I think I've covered each one of them. Oh, uh, one thing we have talked, had conversations with the St. Green and Left Hand Water Conservancy District. Um, 
they're they're doing um, some planning for the overall benefit of the entire basin, and we've had talks with them about the pullback pipeline. Um, it would um, they're they're a trying to get some some money through some federal program. There's some money out there the federal government NRCS. has to spend it. Yeah, NRCS. And, and <clears throat> if they got that money, there would be they might have some money to build some. This would allow the district even to participate with us, similar to the idea of participating in the enlargement. If they participated in the pullback pipeline, it would allow them to uh, have additional water supplies, really for anybody in the basin in the same thing. Which, you know, they wouldn't use our water rights, but there's a lot of there's water downstream that they could, could um, benefit from and, and develop, develop water supplies. And so, um, opportunities for others. Uh, one, one I would backing up our existing water exchange agreements. Um, one concerned water board and uh, we share that concern has expressed to us that when we were looking at the windy gap firming project was um, we were basing all of our planning on everything we have our entire water portfolio and one item in our water portfolio that, that we you always like to have full control of your water <laughs> you know you want to you want to control everything one item we don't have is the uh, Public Service Company Exchange Agreement. That is a 75-year agreement that was started in 2003 or so. Um, so it's no longer 70, it's a 50-year <laughs> agreement now. Um, and there's a 15-year opt-out. Either party can opt out of the agreement with 15-year notice to the other party. Um, I personally uh, shared some of Water Board's concern in the past about, well, that's a 15-year guarantee. <laughs> you know, we have the water supply for sure for 15 years. Um, the, the, part of the concern is, um, if you ask all power companies are looking at going more uh, green, more, more renewables. You don't need water if you're going to put up a solar panel. You don't need water if you're going to put up a wind turbine. Well, not as much water. <laughs> uh, probably the St. Green Power Plant is going to remain because it's natural gas, and the natural gas plants are, are needed as a backup for um, all of the power schemes. But pump storage could back that up too. We just don't know. Um, for sure that those power plants will remain operating, both the Pawnee plant at Brush and the St. Green power plant uh, east of us. Uh, and then you, what does Piesco do? Do they, do they keep their CBP water um, at $100,000 a unit times 10,000 units? You can do that math, it's a whole lot of money. <laughs> and some, you know, yeah. the, somebody back, you know, Piesco got bought out by Excel Energy out of Minnesota or something like that. So somebody back in Minnesota is going to crunch numbers and say, "What's this asset worth?" And so um, that you know that was what that was what the board and staff's concern. Um, I'm very comfortable that we have a great agreement with Piesco is a great partner, but long long term that you know no absolute guarantee that that will stay. So the pumpback pipeline project is our ability to quickly, not quickly, <laughs> I say quickly in construction, to joke and do it. Joke and do it. Wow. Yeah, sure. 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 Yeah, Quickly be able to build that mm -hmm. under our control <clears throat> and start those exchanges <clears throat> and basically take the 3,500 acre feet that we're delivering up to 35, delivering the fiasco, and then use it in the pullback pipeline, and by exchange, take that, get that water. How much of that 3,500 
we would be to do in phase one? Because what's the volume of phase one exchanges? You know, I'd have to look at it. <coughs> I'd have to look at it. But probably, probably on the range, more like about a thousand acre feet or so. I, I apologize for not doing that off the top of my head. But we, we have a, our master plan has all those phases and that was one of them. But we certainly can del deliver it all uh, as we go into the second phase. And I think even the second phase can do it. Okay. It's so, yeah. a lot of information. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> was a short presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so based on what I heard you say, I believe you're saying that probably the pumpback would be a higher priority to you than the enlargement of you. Yeah, I, I would see that we do that. And just out of curiosity, if that's a one and two, where would be maybe the expansion of fund market in that order? Of um, it would be four only because of its cost. I mean, if if cost didn't matter at all, yeah. it would be an enlargement of button rock yeah. in a second because that's right. right you yeah. know, it's above us. It's higher quality water. Um, but it's it's cost is just so high. You know? um, I don't, when I say so high, it, it would be a good deal. Do we currently have a decree for that expansion? We have a similar decree, a 32,000 acre foot decree for an enlargement of Button Rock. So it's 1967. Um, I don't know if I said that right. Is that right, Wes? It's the same as the, the existing reservoir. We filed for the what we're going to build plus the enlargement. Same time. So, again, that's pretty senior. Uh, it's senior to really anything else in the basin in terms of uh, new projects in the basin. It's senior to uh, every, all the bog plans on the Platte River. Uh, it's senior to uh, Coffin Top Decree. Coffin Top is, I think, 72. Um, it's junior to the narrows, well, the narrows are really good now. <laughs> Let you guys think about that one too, but um, that topic is really off the base now. But, uh, yeah, thanks. So, and then finally, um, it's the recreational aspects. You know, uh, Union Reservoir, when it was a private company, uh, it was a private lease. Uh, Water Sports West was the last one to own it. Um, Longmont, when we Acquired controlling interest, we let them know, hey, you know, this is going to be a limited um, time. But they, they continued to lease it privately for about six or seven years. But in the early 1990s, Longmont took over the recreation lease um, for the reservoir. Um, there are numerous uh, recreational improvements the city has done, uh, some of them paid for by. Uh, Grants from the state, both local Colorado and the uh, state of Indian wildlife. Uh, it, it's literally one of the favorite, rec uh, I, I think it's one of the favorite recreation areas in the Longmont area. Our citizens really like it. And in fact, so much so that when the city um, went out about a year or so ago to talk about some of the ballot issues we were looking at, you know, one, of the, one of the highlights of that that whole study was, hey, we want to do, we want to see more recreational opportunities at Union Reservoir. That wasn't included on the ballot because that trail was already going forward. In fact, one of the projects right now we're, that's being looked at is a perimeter trail around Union Reservoir. And that perimeter trail, I well, everybody, I don't know if you've ever been up, I've been up around Lake Macintosh. People love that trail around Lake Macintosh. Well, I you know, go along and around Union Reservoir too. And uh, that's kind of starting in the design phase already started. So that, you know, um, that's, a, that's a good thing. There are other plans for recreational amenities at the Union Reservoir. So uh, most of the people in Longmont, to be honest, I'm not sure they think of Union as a water supply or something. They think it's a great place to take a paddleboard, you know? But yeah, paddleboards are crazy. Baby. Uh, sailing, you know, everything that we do out there. So, so you, so that's. Uh, 
Anyway, um, that's kind of a short run. Well, I'll just run down. That was a very neat reservoir. Rural one. Um, and uh, I just can't say enough on how, how you know, the value of Union Reservoir along that system. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah. Um, the current master plan for expansion of Union, is it, is it set 16 or is it still very much a variable? But it's uh, set at 16. Yeah, yeah, we should raise. Well, the, 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 our, our enlargement plan just basically said what the different race sites you didn't right. pick one. Um, okay. I, I'll tell you honestly, um, that study did tell us that a 19 foot raise is sort of the highest rate, raise we can do reasonably. Um, the 21 foot raise is feasible, technically feasible. But the cost from 19 foot to 21 foot was well, way up because of the because of yeah. being able to get water into it and how much on the north side. I mean, it just impacted a lot more stuff. So I would, you know, from an economic standpoint, it's somewhere between 13 foot and 19 foot. That's the the sweet spot in the election. and that would again depend on a partner if you got a partner. Thanks a lot, Tom. Very informative. Thank you. Okay. How about any agenda revisions? I have none. Sorry? I have none. Oh, I thought you said I have one. <laughs> All right. In development activity, there's really nothing going on there. So, you know the general do. Sorry. No, Jim. Yeah. So for the record, I'd like to show that my items went right through really fast. <laughs> well done. Really <laughs> nice. Nice job, Mark. So, Joe and Holly, uh, yes. I think you're on. All right. Um, <clears throat> So my name is Joe Mahalski. I'm uh, engineering and operations administrator with the city. I've uh, mainly worked on capital projects at the wastewater treatment plant over the past 15 years, kind of a new role that I'm stepping into. So we just wanted, Holly and I wanted to uh, uh, kind of introduce ourselves to you guys and go over just a couple of quick projects that were that are under construction um, in, in, in the city right now. So, um, those two projects will be Price Park um, and then some North St. Brain pipeline rehabilitation near the uh, Old North and South water treatment plants. Um, so Price Park Tank. Um, so again, just, just real quickly going through some of the uh, past work that's been done. So the project was started in September of last year. Um, I don't know if anyone here uh, golfs, uh, but in the uh, parking lot was tore up pretty good um, during the uh, winter season um, last year. Uh, but the weather was pretty nice, so there were still lots of golfers who were uh, driving through there. Uh, but the contractor's really been doing a good job interfacing with the uh, pool customers and with golf um, so that we, so access was, was maintained throughout that period. Um, there was an existing 2 million gallon and 7 million gallon reservoirs that were on the site. Uh, for the most part, the uh, 7 million gallon reservoir was the one that was uh, still in use, but these two pictures um, show, the, uh, show those two reservoirs. Um, on the left, it's the, uh, um, the 7 million gallon, and on the right, it's the 2 million gallon. So those were demoed uh, right away. Um, so moving along into uh, uh, April, of this year, uh, after they had excavated the, the site, they kind of poured. Yeah, so they, this was a one day pour. Uh, there were about 40 uh, concrete trucks that came, came through the site, so it was a busy day, and they actually uh, um, poured it in about uh, seven hours. Um, took them another couple, you know, they were finishing as they went along, but it, it was a long day. You can see it was overcast, it was actually a perfect day for a concrete pour for the guys and everything. 
Um, so it went really well. <clears throat> Can you remind me, so they're replacing the two million, the seven million with with an eight million gallon. That's a, that's what they're for. So that's what, yeah. And this is just some of the rebar. You can see the amount of rebar that kind of goes into that tank slab. Um, and there's no columns. Um, it's a pre-stressed concrete tank. Uh, so the uh, the dome is actually supported by the walls. Um, you'll see uh, some of that in the next few um, slides here. So here you can see on the left, they are lifting, uh, they actually, uh, have it's like a puzzle um, and they pour these pieces on site so they have different casting beds they call them um, so throughout around the entire tank site they had uh, um, uh, stations basically where they would pour these panels you can see how there's they're just slices for the walls there and it's the same for the dome you just can't see it as well um, and they would pour those ahead of time cure up over you know 28 day time frame they come up to strength then you can see the big crane in the background. That crane would lift them into place. Yeah, yeah. so it was, it's quite a quite an operation. Um, they poured that slab in May, and during, just this week we're actually doing the tank fill test. We actually filled the tank over oh, really? this past week uh, with water up to the overflow elevation to uh, uh, to make sure that it would hold the water. And uh, you know, just out of curiosity, when we demo those existing tanks. Uh -huh. yeah. How did we adapt? Would we have any water storage, or how did we right without that? Right. So we have different uh, uh, pressure regulating valves throughout the uh, system, and we are able to uh, transfer. We have three different pressure zones in the system, um, so we're able to transfer water from one zone to another. Um, you know, it's. Uh, uh, not the ideal way to operate during this time period for you know fire flows and just the, that storage capacity but we've been able to get through this this year and a half construction period just using the existing infrastructure um, and the distribution system mm -hmm. so it'll be nice to get this done because this really is the heart of the distribution system um, the original reservoirs were, you know, built turn of the century in the 1900s, um, and uh, a lot of the uh, piping for the, the three zones all come together in this area. Um, so as part of this construction too, what you're not seeing is a uh, pump station. So that pump station is going to give us greater flexibility on how we operate the distribution system as a whole. Once water flowed by gravity from Nelson Flanders and Montgomery Tank down to this location, we really didn't have the ability to go to the other zones under the current, the, the, the old configuration. With this pump station, we're gonna be able to go from zone one to zone two and three, uh, give us better redundancy if something else happens in the distribution system, just give us better flexibility for, for operations where we wanna move water around to. What, what, what's that hole for in the side of the tank? Uh, so that one that you're seeing there is the overflow, the tank overflow. So there's still piping that needs to attach onto that and it'll go to a, uh, um, a manhole where, you know, if there's an overflow event for some reason, hopefully that never happens, but it's a requirement obviously to design that in, that it would overflow. Um, it's going and, directly to a house. It goes through a ditch, ditch to the side. Hardly ever used. That's why I'm here too, it's just so you have a face to the name when you want to come talk. <laughs> but that should, uh, yeah. So we uh, we actually filled the uh, uh, this tank fill test up to that overflow elevation. And then on the right, that picture that you see there, you see that front end loader and a contraption behind him along the uh, um, kind of a wood uh, two by four structure there where they're actually winding the tank. So they went around this tank thousands of times with wire that's probably an eighth of an inch in diameter, again, pre-stressing it. So it's just, uh, you know, wrapping a wood barrel um, to, so that you don't have to use this thick of concrete um, and uh, just gives it its structural integrity. Um, and you can see up at the top there, like I was saying before, those, those uh, um, the dome panels, again, all that weight is distributed to those walls um, 
as far as uh, not having to have any columns on the interior. So it was pretty neat. I actually got to go into the tank uh, two weeks ago for the first time when we were doing our inspection to make sure that the contractor was really ready for the tank fill test and everything. And it's, yeah, it's unbelievable. So, so Joe, does that, would that spill, spill overflow only be like, let's say about the middle? Does that mean that this tank would only be filled about halfway to get it? No, so on the inside, what you're not seeing there is a concrete box that they build up to a higher elevation. Gotcha. It's only a few yeah. feet, probably a couple feet below the, the sure. where the dome joins the top of the um, wall panels. Mm-hmm. And so that that was the the, the tank project. Um, it's slated for completion in April. Um, we still have to uh, test out the pump station. There's still quite a bit of um, electrical, um, obviously the landscaping work, all that needs to be done. Um, some of the tank finishes are starting to go on where they're starting to uh, coat the exterior. They put some brick pilasters up there on the exterior also. Um, but a lot of the work to remaining is still um, electrical. So it's a $21 million project. Uh, it's been on schedule and on budget. Um, uh, so it's a pretty good project. Um, some past engineers here did a really good job planning it. Uh, John Robb was, was the main senior civil engineer. I definitely got to give kudos to him. And then uh, Josh Sherman, obviously the current engineer here, kind of was the project manager towards the beginning um, with all the you know new, new changes and everything. Um, I've taken it over since, since January of this year, but um, a lot of good people working on that project. Yeah, the, the contractor was Garney. Garney. So Garney is the yeah, other contractor. Yeah, they're, they're, they're uh, yeah, we did get a good contract. Yeah. Also. So we I mean, did. So. They're a good pipeline contractor and, and do a lot in water and wastewater also. Yeah. This is the first time I've been able to work with them in my, my career. I've always heard good things and yes, they're, they're doing a good job on the project. It was difficult. The beginning of those first few months when I wasn't involved was really a difficult part of the project. Um, tying into existing water lines and shutdowns and um, kind of like you were alluding to just all the operational changes that we had to make just to make sure that um, you know the, the existing system stayed operational there's a lot of coordination yeah so so with that I'm going to turn it over to Holly so Holly's a new engineer in the uh, water and waste uh, department um, she was with uh, development review prior to that um, but she's uh, handling a lot of the raw water projects for us now. So she'll explain uh, another, another project. We'll go from treated water to raw water. Uh, this project, the North St. Crane Pipeline Line project, is, I uh, thought you might want to know where it is. It's located near 36 and 66, so between our water treatment plant and, and the town of Lyons. We're going to be lining approximately about 1,600 feet of, of a 20, existing 24 inch main. And it's going to go within the area kind of adjacent to Highway 66, within the area that you're seeing. And there we go. Okay. So now you can see kind of where, it, where it's located. Our, beginning, middle, and, and end pit, that, that middle pit is actually located really adjacent to the intersection of 36 and 66. Whenever infrastructure is starting to age, you might have some repairs on it. Um, but then whenever you get to the point where you have so many repairs, then you're either looking at potentially replacing um, or rehabilitating it. Um, because there is so much in this area, and I'll go back to the previous one, you can see perhaps here better than the, than the, the plan. You can see there's a couple ditches. We've got the creek, we've got some buildings, we're obviously adjacent to Highway 66 and 36, and this uh, water main actually goes across one of, one of those roads. Um, we've got floodplains, we've got potential environmental issues, we've got trees. There's just a lot of things on the surface that could be potential conflicts, and so whenever you're going from repair to to potentially replacing or rehabilitating um, in terms of uh, putting a new pipe in the ground. There's just a lot of potential conflicts and so that's why we're doing a rehabilitation uh, type approach in this location.
This is a multi-phase project. This year, we've actually gone through an inspection process, and then next year is going to be the construction phase. As you can see, if you go from left to, to right on this, uh, for these pictures, we did an excavation of that middle, uh, whenever the previous slide it showed a beginning, middle, and, and ending. This is actually a good fit location. Uh, we have a window in the top of the pipe, and we put like a little remote control uh, camera in, in the, after dewatering the pipe. We sent the camera upstream and downstream from that middle uh, location. And what we were looking for was just to make sure that we want to do this rehabilitation, we want to do this liner, but we want to make sure that the pipe is appropriate uh, for, for this mining application. So we were looking for things for like cracking. We were looking for potential anomalies within the pipe um, to make sure that we could line it. And we found things such as the one on the very right side, which was a nice gusher. We have a, a hole in the pipe because it was dewatered at that time. That meant that the groundwater was coming in. But whenever we have a pressurized pipe, what that means is that we're losing our water. And so that water that we were that Ken was just talking about, we want to be able to use it and use it and use it again. We want to make sure that we keep it within the pipeline. And that's kind of the purpose of, of this project. Um, we've, we've completed most of the investigation. The construction is going to be next year. What that construction is going to be is kind of like a sock. It's this flexible uh, sock. It's just isn't a sock, but it's a flexible material. And what you do is you push that sock or that flexible material into the pipeline, and then you expand it, put a little pressure in that, in that sock. You expand it to the diameter, so it's a 24-inch diameter pipe. Once it's expanded to the existing, Pipe. Then what we do is we where the contractor runs UV, a UV light through it, and so it, it goes from flexible to a hard secure in place uh, pipe. And so that then we have a, a cured in place uh, pipe within our within our existing pipe, and then we're ready to we're going to put it back into service uh, at that point in time, and and uh, hopefully we won't have those things like we have on the. In their rights to have an existing pipe. So that's that's the goal. The, I'm working with the contractors now to, to get a final schedule together. Um, but this is this is scheduled for uh, next year. Oh, well, how long a sock are you talking? How many feet are you doing this to? Well, the so we have uh, um, pits at the end as well as the middle, and they are able to run that sock the entire link between pits. So basically we will have we will have a liner that is basically from one pit to another pit. Yeah, so that's about 800 feet and in between pit to pit. Um, and we use this technology quite a bit in the complexion of our sock, so. So is the liner, once it's UV cured, is it structurally, um, is it structural or is it just a seal? My, I, yeah, I've, I've asked uh, the contractor. It is evidently it's a structural pipe. Cool. So yeah, so like I said, we use this quite a bit in the uh, collection system, the same period sewer system. Um, so we haven't used it too much. We've used it in a few other applications on the raw water side. Um, but yeah, it definitely gives us a cost-effective solution when it's uh, difficult just to dig and replace type of areas. I think they do a lot of that. Plumbing line and repair sewer pipes. They, they don't dig anymore. They just so, you know, so which is pretty so yeah. So again, we just kind of wanted to introduce ourselves. We're kind of new in our roles. Uh, we'll probably be coming back from time to time to talk about some other projects. This is only a couple of them that we chose for this time because uh, um, yeah, we didn't uh, want to take up too much of the time with some of the other stuff on the agenda. So. Well, back to the tank. What's the completion date for that? Uh, right now it's April of 24, so spring is what we're looking at. Uh, there might be some landscaping and stuff that has to be done after that, but we're hoping to have the uh, pump station commissioned by then so that we have the functional use of it uh, at that point. What's, what's the status of a historic tank? The historic tank. Oh, the elevated yeah. tank? Yeah. 
Uh, so I don't know too much other than we're not touching it with this project. It's <laughs> iconic. Yeah. And I think for the most part it's being used for telecommunications stuff. So. I don't know. Redmaker made a promise he's going to paint that tower. I don't know if you have anything to do with that. Uh, it's not on the list that I have with that already. <laughs> I don't know how good his promises are. <laughs> you know, everybody, there, there's a lot of people that think that's, you know, kind of a landmark for, for a long time. It helps you find your way home if you're in an old town. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going away then. No. Any other questions? Keep us posted. Yes, that's interesting. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Okay. When we ask, can I guess you're going to talk a little bit about the program project? Yeah, and hopefully it'll be a little bit shorter presentation. <laughs> um, just two two things I wanted to talk about the when you get um, Fermi project. Um, just wanted to a give you a quick update on on the project itself, and uh, we're up about half the height on the on the dam, so uh, you know the project's about halfway done. So that's really good. Um, it's tall enough now that if you've ever um, gone up uh, past Carter Lake to the county road that goes up to Flatiron Reservoir, past Flatiron Reservoir, up to Pinewood Reservoir. Um, right at um, Flatiron Reservoir, you can pull off on the side of the road there and actually see the dam now. I mean, it's you can see how tall it is. It's pretty it's impressive, even though if you're a little bit away from it. Um, and of course, this is the photographs off of the, the website. They're, they take a photograph every Monday and um, post it there, and then you can go back. One thing I've had a lot of fun with watching these photographs, A, you can watch the uh, reservoir come up. This is July 24, so it's a couple, you know, three months ago. Um, you can just see the start of the dam here. But one thing I've found, if, if you can see this rock outcropping here and this rock outcropping here, one way I've been able to watch the raised height of the dam is by looking at those two rock outcroppings. So I'm gonna just fast forward through up to today and you might, you might keep an eye on those rock outcroppings um, as the project went on. Um, this is August 21st and you can, you can see the one on the north the downstream side, the north side of the dam, there's not much left of it by August 21st. Um, a just tiny nubbin of it on September 5th and, you can see the other one so now it's gone and but you can still see the one on the upstream side the downstream side then um, October 10th it's starting to disappear uh, October 23rd you can closer part is gone and then um, November 13th which was last week you can just barely see a little tiny bit right here um, so you can imagine how much of the vertical, the vertical raise. Now, when you look at it, you can really see the dam on, yeah, sure. on both sides of it. So, and the lot of material. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a bummer. So, um, that part is going really well. Um, probably the one other thing on the project I wanted to really talk about is the Colorado River Connectivity Project. That was um, a, a plan that. Uh, Reservoir used to when you get excuse me, reservoir used to come down to here. The dam was relocated to here, and the connectivity channel is being put in there. Um, and uh, that project went very well this summer. I love this picture because you really can see um, you can see where the dam was relocated from here to here, and you can see the connectivity channel coming through there, um, really, uh, I just thought that was a really, yeah, that's really good that's photo. That's in, in the Grand Reef, right? Yeah, support yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and this is actually a close-up of the channel, so 
actually pretty good size, and you can see the, the riprap and everything that went on with it. And this is a picture of a couple weeks ago. We started running water through the connectivity channel. So um, there's still work to be done out there, but this is substantially complete to where they were running water, and this is, uh, I believe, a really great part of the overall Windy Gap permitting project made this possible. Um, it's, it's great for the water user community because we can show them how we can both have water diversion and water facilities, but also protect the environment. So that's the, the this last month's biggest, I think biggest point of, um, is that that water started running through the Colorado River Connectivity Channel. So, um, Sounds like the people up there are commissioned to have a little bit of that. Oh, it's full of new to this last week, but pretty happy with how that all turned out. Yeah, they're they're very happy on the list. So this 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 was a real point of contention for four years, and you know now it's now it's yeah. done and ready. Yeah, it's great. It's really nice. And the nice thing about it is the upper half of this whole creek, I believe, is going to be open to the public. Mm -hmm. So they will have a little line in this creek. So, Anyway, that's really all I had to report, but some, you know, I feel some, some good news. They are working long. Uh, they're pouring a lot of hours into the Jimmy Hollow thing. Well, they are. <laughs> it almost sounds like seven days a week. Yeah, 20, 20 hours a day, two, yeah. two shifts a day. And... Okay, any questions for Ken? Very good. All right, Russ. So just, just real brief on uh, Cash and Lou, we're continuing to have conversations in-house with the other departments and divisions within the city, including the city manager's office and such, and um, trying to continue to work through the, um, the process of notifying impacted uh, individuals for Cash and Lou. Um, so we're still working through that process. We thought that, um, PRPA was going to have in front of the Northern Board in November a couple of their sales for their Windy Gap parent water. That's now uh, looking like it's going to go to the board in December. So um, we're going to have to wait and, and see. So we really don't have any new information on the front of uh, transactions of the parent water, but expected to have two of the three in front of the board in December, and then the, the third one would be in front of the board sometime in the first quarter. So. Um, if we have all that information, we'll do that in December. But it's just a real brief update that we're really, what well, resources staff is working on our internal process for communication of any future changes, whatever and whatever those may be. So the process of informing those people that are going to be impacted by yeah. change that's going pretty we're well. Just, yeah, we're just wanting to make sure that we're not missing anybody, that when we, that we have a a good way to communicate any future changes. So if anybody that is in the process of development, they would be aware of those changes and have enough time to react to those changes. Any questions for the web? So am I hearing correctly that we may or may not have a final evaluation for, we may not have that in December? That's what you're hearing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Definitely first quarter. Yeah, it sounds like first quarter, that's what they're, and, and when they take it to the board, it'll just be the board getting their approval to then complete their transaction. And so I don't know how long it'll take after their approval for the PRPA, the person that, the, the entity that's receiving the, or wishing to purchase the water that that may take. That may take a few months. Right. Yeah, but approval is kind of a nice official it is the yeah. official piece. It is, okay. and, and we think at that point then that it'll all be done. Yeah. Who it is and what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else for West? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Major project listings and anything we want to talk about there. We got a chance to look at what's coming up our way. Questions about it? Yeah. 
Anybody happy with it? Static. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, long term planning. Ken's got some comments about. Yeah. Lots of little signature items. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, what, what we wanted to do was just, I guess, uh, broach the subject. We're not asking for any input, really, even any input or, or decision today. But, um, you know, over the last few years, we've been kind of thinking about what water board, what action the water board takes on things, and what, um, what we have before us. Probably even today's agenda might be a little bit uh, illustrative. We have no development activities at all. <laughs> and, and just uh, to be honest, it seems like um, that is slowing down over time. Um, and uh, a lot of the projects that we've been looking at and a lot of things we've done in the water board um, uh, seem to be uh, coming to fruition. I think it's, it's really good. Um, it, it shows uh, the results of long-term planning on the water board. So what staff wanted to do was just have a conversation with the board about um, what what the board sees um, or has an interest in doing as we go forward. We don't have anything to put out other than, um, you know, there, there are some areas that we may want to consider. Um, if we go back and look at like our, our, char our charge as board, as a water board, you know, it's, it's really, first and foremost, it's the water supply. <laughs> and and I, the board's done an incredible job of that over the years. Um, but also, um, it, there's a little bit of a charge there for water quality, and we've had a number of water quality issues and water quality things that we've brought up over the years. Um, and but there's probably you know there might be some areas that the board might be interested in, in going forward with. Uh, you know, I know uh, uh, right now uh, for. We probably work with the board and staff and, and externally uh, for a uh, in-stream flow program for 20 years. We worked we worked in in-stream flow program for years, um, and really in conjunction with the same rain left that water conservancy district who, who helped us do that, and, and Boulder County and Lyons and you know Crown Lake, a lot of people helped put that together. Some of those kind of things that aren't specifically water supply related but that uh, we I believe the community is interested in and would like us to, to move forward um, so we, we might want to you know look at a few of those types of things um, right now the district has a stream management plan they put together uh, I think it's a good plan and, and they're continuing to move forward with that and we, we appreciate all their efforts but you know, are there um, so really what we wanted to do is, is kind of broach the subject and let water board think about it um, either either we can talk about it next month or January or something like that you know are, are you concerned about anything you know is staff bringing the right things to you are there areas you would like to step out in the future um, and, and I'm, I'm not going to try to throw anything on the table but you know um, maybe some areas like you know, storm drainage, uh, uh, water quality downstream along the you know, Just anything, anything, you know, are you comfortable with where water board, what we're bringing to water board, what we're working? And we, we, you know, just kind of want water board to think about that. You know, what's the future of water board and, and, and where, where do we want to go? Um, I would propose if water board want, wants, we're more than happy to do some kind of strategic planning effort if you feel that's necessary. You know, bring in somebody where we could look at what we do and how we do it and are we doing it right. Um, also, I always like to remind even ourselves, as much as anybody, you know, water boards advisory to council. And, and so, um, uh, you know, we would want to uh, talk with the council too. You know, uh, council, are you getting everything you need from water board? Are you getting the advice you want in, in the water arena? Um, is there anything more you would like? Um, and so, 
I'm not trying to not trying to throw anything out there other than um, we've offered to the water board that if, if you <coughs> want us to do any process or, or bring anything up, um, feel free to think about that. And over the next couple two or three months, we can maybe talk about that. And if there's anything you would like us to do more, so we just want to make sure we're we're meeting um, what water board needs from staff and, and bringing the items that we need. And, any areas you need to, you know, we need to expand upon or contract on. Um, and, uh, I personally am very interested in water quality. I think we have good water quality, but I think water quality issues are going to become increasingly more of an important part of the picture for water utilities. So, like, and I'm, I'm talking about portable water quality, I'm talking about PCOS, I'm talking about lead lines, things like that, and that's, you know, like distribution system oriented um, and treatment oriented. Um, but I would be happy to have more of that information. You know, we're kind of a public conduit too. I, again, this is all at the discretion of city council, but we're a public conduit as well. So I would love to have more conversations around that. It's not my area of expertise, so I don't have great questions for you. But um, it's something that I think is increasingly going to be more and more important in the water industry. And yeah, so we, I'd like we finally to brought the water tank in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got one little touch on that, so great. Um, yeah. Another thing that I've wanted to do in the past, and I'm speaking of because I do have you know almost ten years on the board, even though I'm kind of new uh, in a weird way, is that there's the water loss audit, and that is definitely a distribution system, um, and everything from like billing and customer information system stuff. But the water loss audit is this huge thingy. Um, it doesn't have to be hard, but it's a it's a conservation measure that's revenue positive. Oh my gosh, that's neat. Um, and so I would be interested in seeing how the board could support that and or educate council on it too, because um, it's a it's a great activity. Like you can save water, you can save money. Great, yeah, no, that's and make more money. Cool. Yeah, I'm all for that. So those would be two things I'd be excited about, and they are distribution <coughs> system. Really yeah, I'd like to see a little bit more on water distribution, the distribution system, and have a better understanding of how that works. For the city. See, Joe left and so he didn't work. He left at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> we can get him back. Now we can give him all kinds of tasks. So. You know, and again, water quality is very important, but water quantity is certainly an important factor too. So I'd love to hear more about in-stream flow and what we can do um, to push that a little bit more. And along with that, I think um, I'd like to hear more about what's going on with fish passage in particular and how that impacts the city from that perspective. Knowing that like, sounds like the Beckwith is soon maybe, or oh, I don't know about soon, but maybe the next path, you know, that might be involved in it and that, and what does that mean to the city from a, again, thinking you know when we lost the bonus ditch you know we had to, in order to make that elevation up we had to do like nine drop structures and what was that impact so the same thing with Beckwith if you lose that how do we deal with that and what is what are the success for you know because we've got what what's the uh, fish passage notebook now or it's the playbook you know and maybe a, a little bit on that too uh, yeah, we should actually that's a good pitch to make. So that's a good idea. And then certainly, you know, again, um, I'm aware of some of the partnerships, but you know, again, it was great to hear the pump back as much our priority and how do we, you know, how do we kind of push some of those things if there's such advantages uh, to the city to do that. Again, you know, always an issue of dollars, right? Yeah. And the timing and people and to, to be able to do those kind of things. So have more discussions about maybe those long range capital projects and how we can better partner with other folks to make some of those things happen. You know, speaking of water loss, I, maybe it's been said already, but I, I'm curious, the state of our plant, we're talking about lining pipes up Near lines. What's the state of our facility in Long Rock per se? I mean, at what point is there concern of, of the age, and how does it age, and 
what do we do about it if, you know, I'd rather have something proactive rather than, you know, let disasters determine when we get in and do something. So, yeah. we can talk about that a little bit. I, I'd like to know that we have a fairly safe infrastructure as well with that. Yeah, the asset management and distribution system. Yeah. Yeah. Almost a deeper dive into that fantastic figure that they had both of that last month and the month before where it was like all of these kind of like uh, time time periods where you know where, where things are starting to kind gotcha. of you know come out of um, yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of you know, starting to like deteriorate or whatever life cycle kind of assessment. Um, like a deeper dive into something like that figure would be a visual kind of, or, or a nice supplement to that kind of um, I will say that, I, I mean, so uh, water quality is my area of expertise, so if you don't have to twist my arm on that one, I would love to, to hear more about that. Um, and it, uh, something that came to mind as we were talking, I mean, as you start to recycle water, of course, this amazing water quality that we do have here in Longmont starts to deteriorate, right? Like, so you, you take water that has come out of the wastewater treatment plant, you pump it back upstream, and then you say, well, we'll use that again, you know, and of course, if you use it on a lawn or something, then that's fine, but if you're using it um, in uh, municipal deliveries with, with drinking water, I mean, uh, there, there will be an inherent quality loss in that that really, that um, you can't do a whole lot about. I mean, but taking water from Know, crystal clear streams in the mountains, oh, right? Better. I mean, obviously that's better, right? So, so there, there's some, so there's some quality issues just associated with water use, reuse that might be kind of interesting to think about. And um, that said, I'm, I, I've always been kind of fascinated by the concept of, by these exchanges um, and, and like these different points of diversion and all these kind of things, right? Where, where what happens in the middle, right? And and that's where these in-stream flow type programs really need to kind of like show show their magic and their work essentially is ensuring that that even when you are changing where you're taking the water from and you're exchanging point of diversion from here to there or whatever um, or you're putting water back in the river down here but you're taking it from up here and there's there's a stretch in between where where those in-stream flow programs are really important and i would say that that's well, it's too bad Marshall isn't here, but I, I'm curious about what does council think about what they're getting from us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I really don't know because I never hear. But certainly there's some opinions I imagine, but uh, I just don't know. And Ken, that was going to be my question because now that we have a realigned council marginally post election, what is their process? Do they convene and really prioritize as a collective once they have? some turnover or is that just you know, i've lived for 23 years about 24 years i don't even know what they do from a sequence perspective because they do turn over with some regularity and it does sometimes create new focus but i don't think they intentionally go through here's what we want to do or if it's a little bit more ad hoc kind of you know month to month basis and whatever the win is is what they're working on right? <clears throat> but it would be nice to have some more direction because we don't get a lot of top down direction or anything from council which is okay but if they had something, but they're more interested in the yeah. idea. Well, and knowing that, like when Yap, and it was a pretty significant project for the city, at what level are you or you know involved in any kind of organization to the new council members so that they have a better understanding of some of this operation? So, yeah, we, we actually do have normally, I can't say every, I've always had a movie, we normally have. Uh, a time where the new council members come down and meet with staff in each of the division, major departments, you know, and, and they always want to come down to the water department. I've had a number of times where, you know, we we, we get like an hour. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to load. Don't you know, get the union reservation. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't bring you to the <laughs> <bridge work. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, we, we, we do get an opportunity to at least talk to them. And, and they, you know, kind of explain what the department is, and, and more than anything else, give them a face and a name for the, they don't want access. But yeah, it always always helps to have more conversation with all this stuff. So yeah, no, we're, we're more than happy to talk to our council and um, you know get, get more feedback. That's that's 
pretty good start with the list. Yeah. Yeah. They were good at it. And I think that's important. When we do stuff like that, we make sure that we're uh, no, I, 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 you know, I appreciate that feedback and, and feel free to, you know, think about it over the next few months and if there's more, we're, we're more than happy to, um, so, sometimes you just keep plugging away <laughs> and don't take time to say, hey, you know, where are we going with it? How are we doing? Well, for us, that, that pump rat presentation was good, I, you know, I've never seen it. How that all works, so I appreciate that. It was yeah. informative. It takes a little bit to figure it out. I really truly understand you. It's yeah. go out there. And, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that. the, that's the level of detail that I would enjoy. For yeah. some topic, every every meeting, to be honest, like so, so just I mean, pick some random topic. It doesn't even necessarily matter because as we start to stitch those things together, we just can increase our overall understanding of the system yeah. in general. I mean, you know. So I, I thought it was fantastic. Well, I, I mean, personally, I mean, I've heard about the pump back for a long, long time. <laughs> you know, and it was always, you know, we're going to go through your open space to do that. And I was like, was it really a Why? negative overtone for me? Until I heard, you know, and saw the big picture and what the advantages are for the exchanges and the things that we can do further upstream. So uh, I thought it was a great presentation today. Very helpful. I mean, just as a, another example that could go on to the list, like I, I would like that same, I mean, this would be really heavy to be honest, but that same level of detail on just like all the ditches really, right? Like where mm -hmm. where they go from and to and who who, who has the lion's share of the, of the shares and and how, you know, Longmont got involved uh, eventually and, and, you know, to what extent we operate with partners, you know, through the entire cable system. Of course, that, that, that yeah, I was gonna say that. <laughs> so, so of course, it would. I mean, it would have to be small bits. You know, maybe you, you break it into the, that upper dip, upper ditch, lower ditch kind of concept, or even fourths or something, or or something that we, you know, take off some of those small pieces that, or the biggest ones we start with first, or whatever it is. But but some level of detail on 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 that. Would be Great. Well, we've got an expert in the and I was going to say and where we're going to be when where are we going to be in ten years with these big companies? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a good <laughs> question. Good, good conversation to have. Yeah, we still have ditch riders. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I mean. Uh, yes, yeah. we do. Um, but as they age out or need to be replaced, it's very challenging to find replacement dish riders. Yeah. They have any concept of what that actually is. You know, twenty years ago that we you know we got a weekly report. You know, I don't I can't remember the guy's name and must have been a dish writer for decades. But gives you a lot of detail but don't hear much about it. That's that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to do, Ken. I hope you know you can't retire for another ten years. You know <laughs> well we'll see. <laughs> but uh, but actually to, to kind of wrap in, kind of into we, we have been putting or we we're trying to put in a you know a list of waterboard items we're trying to put like one item a month because we don't want to overload the meetings but yeah we'll, we'll try to we'll try to do that process where we'll bring a few things like that yeah. so feel free to look at that list we have and say you know I'd rather right now look, hear about this or Sometimes I like to hear about that. But yeah, we, we you know we still got things like the Dollar Hour River presentation. That, and, you know, this month we did Union Reservoir. And yeah, it would be really good. And and the good thing is it's being recorded, so everybody can, you know, in the community can and make it a learning process for us. Where do those recordings live? Like YouTube. They do. You are waterboarding. On the so. city of Longmont YouTube. Okay. Because I was going to ask too about things like the slides that are presented and that kind of stuff. I guess it's maybe a new point of support that they need in that way. But, mm -hmm. but um, if you if they would if you have access to the slides, that'd be nice. Yeah, I guess on YouTube. Yeah. I, I would. I mean, maybe we could even have a place where they live. Because um, is that and if the partners that come in and share, I, I would like to go back and review those things periodically, just because I'm I'm too um, uh, 
I'm not smart enough to absorb everything immediately. You know, so so it would be nice to maybe review those things with them too. Okay. Super. Well, thank you very much. much you need it. Yeah. yeah. We, we we got some. All right. Thank you. Any other items that somebody wants to bring up? Seeing none. Is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right. And second, there is a second to the whole.